Welcome to another class on analysis of Boolean function. And today's class, we will talk about complex hypercontractivity. Okay, so. Okay, so we will follow. So this would be a presentation of Weisler's paper, which basically solves hypercontractivity, um, it proves the complex hypercontractivity in, in a certain range. So this is a paper, so today is a paper of Weisler, um, which is, I think it's from the eighties, uh, which is called two point inequality, um, the Hamid semi group and two girls, vice stress. Uh, semi group. So that's the number of a paper, and there will be parts of this presentation that we have to fill the gaps. And so, if you have any troubles doing that, you can check out the paper. Okay, so the main result of today is the following. Uh, let infinity, uh, but exclude the case two less or equal than p less than q uh, less or equal than q less or equal than three. Um, and the dual case of that, okay. Um, and then let who will be a complex number, then we have that expectation of T who of F Q, one over Q is less so equal than the expectation of F P, one over P, for all F in the Hemian cube and complex, if and only if we have a certain equality in between the exponents, which is the following. Okay. Um, let me make so. So the, the 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 question is, I give you some p's and q's, and I give you some ho, and you want to know if this operator is bounded from L p to L q, and the answer is if and only if we have this, and we saw that this. So let me make some observations. So we saw that this is the local condition. Let me put some star here. So star is just, is, is the local condition. So we, we prove that if the inequality was true, we must have that, so it's necessary. So necessary. Okay, and then basically what we did here was to do second variation analysis on this inequality. And so 
also note that if you could ask, well, what, what, what do you mean by this when say Q is infinity, for instance, or P is infinity? Um, so note that if, well, from this inequality, we derive that easily. So you look at this left-hand side and just bound it trivially by the triangle inequality. And what you get is, so note that star implies the moduli of who is less or equal than this. So if Q is infinity, uh, the local condition is saying then O is zero and zero is the trivial case. I mean, you're just projecting the function into constants and, uh, and by the fact that P is greater than one, uh, you have the inequality. Uh, so the case Q is infinity, you can rule out, you don't need to study. So you can assume that Q is finite anyway. Um, and then this thing makes sense, okay? Um, so another observation, say, um, and also observe that uh, if this is true for every F a complex, so it's, then it's also true for every uh, F um, real, and then we know that if Ho is real and satisfies this condition, then we have the real hyperconductivity result. And so, and this is if and only if in the real case. So this is another way of seeing that the case Q equals infinity has no uh, interest here. And also similar, so maybe directly right here, and similar if P equals one. P goes on again, O has to be zero. Any case, so we don't need to consider the extreme cases. Um, maybe another observation is that, and this comes from duality, that if this is true for, say, some um, P, Q, and some Ho, then we also have and the conjugate of Ho, okay? And so uh, what you can see is that if Ho satisfies this, the conjugate also satisfies this because if you take conjugate, oh, if you take conjugate here, this is basically just putting out, and then the norm stays the same, and also in here, okay. Uh, so by reflection on the um, on the real axis, you can also reflect by two, whole by minus whole. The same the same guys work with. Um, in here, so the, the, this region is actually, so uh, before I say this, let me continue here. So you, you also have, a, if you have for P, Q, and Ho, then you have for Q prime, P prime, and Ho prime, and this, these are the dual exponents. And so, so therefore, if I must exclude this case, I must exclude also the dual. If I can't show anything here, definitely also cannot show anything in here. But in any case, this reduces, this also this implication reduces the, the cases we, we have to prove the inequality in any case. And another in the, the, the observation here is that the region is star. Uh, the region star is something like this. is something like this. Ugh. 
this was bad. Let me try again. Something, something like ellipsoid, uh, which I'm somehow struggling to make. Yes, yeah, something like that. Okay. Uh, inside, of course, this is, uh, and then we have like uh, I don't know, minus one here, one here. It's something like that. And you have to figure out exactly, but it looks sort of, it's not ellipsoid, uh, but it looks sort of like an ellipsoid. Um, okay. So, and then we already know a bunch of things, of course, that you only need to prove so, so then we only need to prove the result, say for n equals one, you don't need to use the full Hemming cube. You only need to show that um, in the n equals one case because we have the power trick and what it is that case and and now I only need to show if by the other, uh, say uh, we have that case, and we we can we can assume that uh, that we are not in that range. Okay. Okay. Well, the, between two and three, and um, three halves and two. Okay, so and this amounts to show what? So now we have just a what's called a two point inequality, which we can write explicitly. So if I start with the function f, which is just ax plus b, then that's the function I need to show. Um, yeah, so I just need to show that expectation of ax plus b, and then you multiply by whole, q, one over q is less or equal than the expectation of ax plus b, um, say x1, because you only have one variable, p, one over p, and this is equivalent to, to what? So let me let me say for instance that a equals a equals say x e to the power i uh, alpha minus beta and say a uh, plus beta and say b is y e to the power i beta and say x and y are say positive numbers and let me fix rho to be uh, say t e to the power minus i beta, okay? So if I use this, then I know that, so I know that this is equivalent to the following inequality. Um, so note that I can remove this i to the power i beta here, and only have an i alpha here. And then we have like, like a translation by theta. Um, plus x e to the power i alpha minus theta plus y to the power q. And we have a half here. We have a half here. One over q. That has to be less or equal than x minus y to the power p, x plus y to the power p, a half and one over p. And then we have to show this for every x and y positive and for every alpha and as long as 
rho equals t to the of minus i theta satisfies star. And keep in mind that star here will always be, we always be this inequality for the parameter rho. Okay. So that's what we need to show. And then we can rewrite this as what we need to show is the following, is that if X minus I P, oh, there is an alpha here, I forgot. X I alpha minus Y. Plus Y. P. So we need, what we need to show is the following that If this is true, but is if the right hand side here, this thing, oh, I forgot the half here. If this thing here is one, which is the same as saying that this thing is two, then this whole thing has to be less or equal than one. And so if you raise to the power Q also less or equal than one, and then you multiply by two. And so you need to have this. That's what we need to show with with these conditions here. Okay, so that's our goal now. To show this inequality. And the idea here, the basic idea in proving such a thing is the following. So the basic idea is to say, to consider this as a function, say this right hand side, left hand side, as a function of P, uh, X, Y, P and alpha, okay, and then by forcing it to be true, there will be an implicit function argument here. So, so I will be able to write, um, say, the function um, y in the variable y. I'll be, be able to write the variable y as a function of, say, x alpha and p. Okay. And and so, and. The, and so we, we, we play with this idea. So then we want to know that um, when y is given by such a function in terms of x, y, alpha, and p, do we have this inequality? Okay. So that's more or less the idea. Okay, so, so let's go with that. So, so let f, x, y, alpha, p, be this thing. Which is this guy here. Okay. Uh, we can rewrite this in a more convenient way, open this, this formulas. And then note now, now we want to show that if, if f x y alpha p equals two, then f x y alpha minus theta q is less so you could two. That's what we want to show because this is the right hand side here. Okay. 
And then what you do is the following. So let me first, for instance, compute the derivative in y of f x alpha uh, alpha p. Okay. And if you use this formula here, then you will see that this will be what? P over two, x squared plus y squared minus two xy cos alpha, and then P over two minus one, and then times the derivative of the inside, which will be what? Two something, so it'd be y minus x cos alpha. And then the other one will be the same uh, and then that would be what a y plus x cos alpha um, and then the idea is the following so my claim is that this is positive okay why is that the case let's see now so suppose that cosine is positive, say. So if cosine of alpha is positive, this is bigger than zero, this is bigger than zero. Great. Well, definitely um, um, this bit is bigger than this bit. So say for instance, that P is greater than two, okay, to easy uh, the, the proof now. Um, so if, if P is greater or, equal, greater, greater or equal than two, then this thing is greater or equal than zero, and also this thing. So if cos is positive, this bit is bigger than this bit, definitely, and this bit is bigger than this bit, because alpha, x, and y are positive numbers, and cosine, I'm assuming, is positive. If cosine is uh, a negative, then the thing is reversed because then um, did I do some mistake here? Um, yeah, so it's sorry about that. Uh, uh, what we have to do here is actually we do need to do something else need to isolate here. So let me let me isolate here this guy. So then we have this thing. Plus the other guy. And then we have plus, um, and then we have plus the other one, which would be what x cos alpha p as well, and then the same thing, x squared plus y squared, a minus two x y, a plus two x i cos alpha over two minus one minus yes that's what we have so let's put the plus here okay so the claim is that this thing is is positive okay let's see why it is positive um, okay, sorry, I'm having some technical problems here. Um, okay, so let's see why this thing is positive. It's actually pretty simple, let's see. So this bit is always positive. Okay, great. If cos is positive, then uh, and p is greater than greater equal to two, for instance. Then this part is definitely greater than that number. So this thing is positive, and cos is positive. X is positive. So everything is positive. If cos is negative, then this thing reverses. Uh, this thing is now greater than that. 
And so this part is negative, but COSO was negative. So negative and negative, we get positively. And if, so that shows for the case P greater or equal than two. And if P is between one and two, then I leave you for two to few with the tails. Is it still true? Okay. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a simple computation. Okay. And then by the same tokens, and then since um, F of X, Y, alpha P, so note what it is, is that uh, it's symmetric in X and Y. You can change alpha by minus alpha, for instance, if you like. And so differentiating in X is basically the same as differentiating in Y. And so we also have Uh, well, also note that is it is. Yes, I can put plus or minus in both. But in any case, I can change y x, and I can put plus or minus here if you like, p, and uh, and so. If you like, any case. Um, so there will be a function f of x by the implicit function theorem, say, such that f of x, f of x alpha p, alpha p equals two. Okay. And let me prove some things about this function. Um, first is that fx alpha p is defined for zero less than x less or equal to one. Okay. Two, that this function decreases. Three, that it, it is its own inverse. And so by these things, you can conclude. So um, y equals f of x alpha p, which is what we're doing here, uh, is um, is the largest. Such that Less or equal to two. Because what we're trying to invert um, this thing, and we do know that this thing is, um, as a function of y, is increasing. Okay, so if I require that is less or equal to two, and then I put some y that, that, that satisfies this, there is a mistake here. So y alpha p. And I put some y here that this is less or equal to two, then I can keep increasing that y until I hit something that is exactly two, and that will be exactly this function. So this y is the largest, okay? And then four is that, um, well, let me give some, we wanna show this, this is the goal. So let me give you, let me put some number for this. This is the goal. And then I'm saying that the goal is equivalent to show that T is less or equal than an infimum in alpha, infimum in X between zero and one of F of X alpha Q divided by F of X alpha plus theta P. Okay, recall that
that rho is t e minus i theta. Okay, so the goal now is translated in showing this inequality. Okay, so let's prove this proposition. Okay, so let's prove one for instance. Well, who is f of x zero alpha p? Okay, let's recall what f is. F is just this guy. So if I put uh, y equals zero, what do I get? I just get x raised to p and x to raised to p. So I get two moduli of x, which x is positive. So x to the power p, which is less than two. What does happen when I put one? Okay, which this is um, x squared plus one plus two x cos alpha p over two plus x squared plus one minus two x cos alpha p over two. Okay, I want to show that this is greater than two. Because if then is greater than two, since I know that if this function here is increasing as a function of y, there will be exactly one guy defined. Uh, this function f of x alpha will be defined for this particular x that was given. So, okay, so, so maybe I should start like proving one. We should move this thing a bit to, the, to here. Let's see. Ugh. Let x be, be a number between zero and one. And then I do this, okay? So then my claim is that this is greater than two. And how do I know that this thing is greater than two for, for every x between zero and one? Well, what, what I do is the following. I know that this function is increasing on x. So I just need to test what f of zero, one alpha p is, because then everything will be greater than, than, than two. But this is exactly two. And so, so that's why. So, Okay, so this shows one, item one. Item two, um, I need to show that this is decreasing as a function of x. Then what you do is the following. We do know that zero equals derivative of x of f of x f alpha p, because this was identically equal to two. So you dif if you differentiate this whole thing, you get derivative of x, f alpha p, plus derivative in y of f x, f alpha p, times derivative in x of f. We do know that this thing is positive, this thing is positive, and so therefore, oops, so therefore, this thing has to be negative. Item three, um, it is item three. It is its own inverse. Well, let's do it. What is f of x alpha p x alpha p, okay? Uh, I do know that this thing is symmetric. So this is x, f of x, alpha p, alpha p, but this is by definition true. 
And so we conclude that F of this guy as X um, alpha P equals um, X, because this is supposed to be the F of whatever it is in here. So what we're doing is, is whatever it is in here, this guy should be F of that, if, if this whole thing is true. Okay, so then we get that. So these were easy. So let me go to four. Four is also not that hard. Let's show. So we know that one is equivalent to the statement Fx alpha, Fxy alpha P, capital F equals two implies um, that Fx alpha theta, uh, alpha minus theta Q is less or equal than two. We saw that before which was exactly when we defined this function f here. And this one here is exactly this, this is statement that we wrote. Here, okay. But then you know that, well, this happens if and only if f of, um, Oh, this, this is not entirely right. I forgot there is a T multiplying X here. So we should fix this side here. Because in here, recall that we're multiplying by whole and who has a part with model one, which is e to the minus I theta, and but also some radial part. Okay, so. We forgot that T. Um, so then what we want to show is this, well, it's following this. Um, if Y is F of X alpha P, then this, we, this we, is what we have to show because this only happens if Y is F of X alpha P. So that's what we want to show. Great. So, but we know then y equals f of tx, say alpha minus theta q is the largest. This is by item three. It's a, a consequence of item three. Okay, so the largest guy that satisfies this, and then therefore it will be equal to two, is exactly this. That's what uh, I mean. And so, to this be true, it can only be that this guy is less or equal than the largest, which is this guy. Okay. And now we do some trick. Um, then uh, let say X be F of X not alpha minus theta P, which we can because this function maps zero one to zero one. Um, So the, the function f, if it wasn't clear, by now we know that f maps 0, 1 to 0, 1, and the derivative in x of f is decreasing. Okay, so it just inverts the, the order of the numbers in 0, 1 by some way, okay. Um, so define f x to be that divided by t, and then we know that f of t 
times x, alpha minus theta q is what? This has to be x naught by the invert, by, by item three, that we can invert. If this function, it's, it is its own inverse, okay? And therefore, um, and so that implies that x is, um, what I want to do now. Okay, so then what we do is we apply F on both sides of this inequality. And so F will invert the order because F is decreasing. And so if I apply F, I get X because it's on, it is it is on inverse. And then I just, um, F of TX, I just have that. And what F I want to apply, I want to apply F, x alpha p, x alpha p, okay, I, I did that, but then this is equivalent to what, what I do next, I know that x is defined by this, then I just replace, And then this is equivalent to say, what? Well, and, and sorry, and what is that? Well, that's x naught. So I can just erase this and it's x naught alpha q, alpha minus theta, oh no, alpha, alpha p, sorry. And then that implies that t is less so equal than f of x naught alpha minus theta, um, oh, this was, oh, this was, oh, there was a mistake here. Let me see what the mistake is. I think this is Q. Yeah, so let me go through it again. This is Q. And then if, if I apply Tx and apply this, then I get X naught, great. Then I just apply F of alpha P on both sides here. And so we get this. Now this guy is X naught, so just replace. And then I have, and X is this guy. So this is supposed to be Q. Okay, and then I just rearrange terms. Um, and then I just replace alpha by alpha plus theta. Which is okay because the thing is periodic anyway. Um, and so we concluded that this, which what we would like to show, it's exactly equivalent to the statement, is now equivalent to these inequality here. Okay, and then if we take the infima, and then that means that it's equivalent to take the infima in say in alpha, and then the infima in x naught, let me replace x naught by x. And then we get this. Which is the claim? What is the claim? Which is exactly the claim here. Okay. And so now we end up with an inequality, which is this. And this inequality for this implicit function little f is equivalent to the hypercontractivity uh, estimate. Okay. So far, we didn't make any constraints on the P's and Q's and et cetera. Uh, and we haven't used uh, 
inequality star so far. So we're just rewriting the problem in some other way. Okay, so let me then name this inequality here to be two. Okay, now, now we want to show two, okay? And um, the only assumption is that T times e to the power minus I theta satisfies that inequality that whole has to satisfy. And then F is just an implicit function. Little F here is just some, some implicit function given by this capital function F. Okay. So let me state another proposition now. Um, that um, star, which is the inequality for the whole parameter, is equivalent. Let me write in black. Star is equivalent to And so that's why this, in, in, this new formulation is interesting because that inequality for who, let me review, remember what an inequality is, this inequality here, leave it, circle it. Um, this inequality is equivalent to that other one, this one here. And this one has a very nice shape. This is more or less like this in a way. This, there is a quotient, is an infinite in alpha, and there is some translation by theta. So it looks similar to that guy. And that's why it, we're gonna prove this proposition. Okay, um, it's actually easy. So let me just uh, rearrange this. So what that, this is telling that T is less or equal than this guy point-wise for every alpha. So let's write what that is. So let's just multiply both sides. So you just take this guy, raise the squared on both sides and multiply and rearrange terms. So after multiplication and re uh, terms, we get the following. Um, and you just have to trust me that this is the right thing. Um, oh no, sorry, that, that's, that's just after I did something wrong here. Um, this is, is t squared q minus two cosine two alpha. And then you can guess how cosine two alpha shows up here because you have a cosine squared and you can write it using a trigonometric identity with cosine of two alpha here. Similar for theta. And then once you have the, like the sum, then you have cosine of the sum. And so you, you, you can apply another trigonometric identity here. Uh, 
uh, this whole thing has to be vastly equal than P minus Q times T squared. Okay. So this is just multiplying and rearranging. Okay. And then using some trig identities. Um, yes, but then you realize something. Well, you have what? You have cosine alpha here and you have sine alpha. So this has to be valid for every alpha. So as, as alpha varies, uh, so, so you have cos here and sine here, as alpha varies between all the possible angles, what you get is that whatever is multiplying cosine to alpha, you have to square it. Whatever is multiplying sine to alpha, you have to square it, add the squares and take the square root. Okay. Um, so, so if you, so taking the soup in alpha, we get, so which we get exactly like T squared minus Q over two minus P minus two cosine of two theta squared plus P minus two sine two theta, this is squared. And then you'd have to take the square root has to be less or equal than this. Okay, in particular, these guys have to be positive, of course. And then, well, what is this? This is exactly which if you multiply by p to the minus i theta, this will be exactly this. Uh, oh, there is a two here, of course. Then you can cancel this two and then it applies. Okay, so you can see that this is exactly that. And that's exactly what we had uh, before. And so it applies the, the, it implies inequality, okay. And so, okay, so now we have these two equivalent, very, sorry, not equivalent, but just two very similar conditions. And now our work is to prove that this guy it equals this guy uh, for every alpha and um, for every, sorry, for every theta. That's our goal to show that if T e to the power minus I theta satisfies, sorry, sorry, given a theta, any, any angle, then uh, this and P and Q between one and infinity and not with that restriction, not being between two and three and et cetera, then this quantity equals this quantity. So we now we have removed the role of T. Now it's just the angle, okay? And then we just, as uh, an inequality like that, okay? And, and so that's what we're gonna show. Okay, and then the restriction on P and Q will show up. So, so far, I haven't used the restriction on P and Q so far. Okay, we're getting there. Um, let me show another proposition. And that will pretty much be where we finish everything. So this will be a long proposition. Yes, and then this will complete the proof, basically, because this proposition claims exactly what I wanted to claim. So if one less than P, say less or equal than Q less than infinity, and then exclude not Q less or equal than P less or equal than Q less or equal than three. And the dual case, which is three halves less or equal than P and Q less or equal than two. Then um, infimum in alpha, infimum in uh, zero less or equal than X less or equal than one of F of X alpha Q 
f of x alpha plus theta p equals the infinity in alpha of one. Let me put a square here so that to make it better. Of alpha. Okay. And that completes the proof of that we would complete the proof of the main result. Okay. So proof. Um, okay. So step one. I want to show this inequality. So I want to split this equality between this and that. And I'm going to show both inequalities and then so forth. Then they have, then they have to be equal. Okay, so there is a nice change of variables that helps here. And we're going to use this multiple times. So, um, Okay, so um, okay. So before we go to step one, let me show this change of variables. So what is this useful change of variables? It's using polar coordinates. So I'm gonna say that X is some R cos phi, and then Y is some R sine phi. Okay, that's the polar change of coordinates. And if you use that change of coordinates, then it becomes easier to see uh, R as a function of phi. So before we had Y as a function of the X, and now we want to, to see R as a function of phi. Um, so y was some f of x alpha q, q or p or something. And then now we want to exchange that to see um, r as some r of phi. Okay, that's the idea. So we call that f of x, y alpha P was what? Well, was whatever it was, but if I replaced by this coordinate, that's what we get. And you can check the calculation later. Move P over two. And so if we want, if so f is two, if and only if um, r minus two, say as a function of phi, equals, let me omit this for the moment, equals that. Never think two over p. Okay, so um, okay, so then it's easier. To, so now you can see exactly how r depends on p. Before we didn't know exactly how y was depending on x, uh, but in here in this polar coordinate, we know exactly, and the so we want to show step one so let me write here step one which is lasso equal so let me maybe give a name to this let me give this name three so now we want to show three okay and we want to show that in three lasso equal is, is true. 
Okay, so, so first of all, I want to compute this limit here. Because if I want to show this is lasso equal, and this is so, so, so these are both like infimums on the left hand side. Okay, so if I show that there is some value of x such that this value of x here is equal to that or less or equal to this thing, okay, then I can take infimums on both sides and I have less or equal here. So that's what I'm claiming. And then my claim is that the appropriate value of x is exactly when f is x is one. Okay, so let me do that. And what is that limit? Well, that's exactly when p converges to zero. Um, because if you look, if x is converging to one, p is converging to zero. And so if p is converging to zero, look here, if p is zero, this whole thing here is one. So R is one and so far X is one. Okay. And so that would be exactly when phi converts to zero of one minus R squared cos phi squared. And then uh, what F is, um, well, F, F is Y. Okay. And Y is R sine phi. And so R squared, Sine of phi squared. And then what we do is just remove that r and put minus two here. Okay. And now you have, well, minus two equals this formula here. And so now you can apply, you know, I'm not going to do that. And then you can apply the L'Hopital L, L rule, differentiate numerator and denominator twice in phi. It's a messy computation when you do it. Uh, and then you get a limit, which is what? Is supposed to be one plus um, a half the second derivative in phi of r minus two. Because what, what, what we're doing here is basically, if you consider r as a function of cosine, which is here, what you're doing is the following. You're taking um, r squared and you are taking out cosine of squared, which is like the variable that it depends and divided by one minus cosine of squared, okay? And as phi goes to zero, cosine squared converges to one. So basically what you're doing is differentiating this when cosine of, of phi is one. Okay, so when the derivative is zero. Okay, and so, so what you can do is you can add and remove the value at the cosine r equals one, which is one. And so you, you, you will get this extra one here by that, and you'll get the second derivative. Okay, so you can figure out exactly what that is, but basically what we're doing is something like r minus two, and then you take one, which is the value when cosine, when phi is zero, you get one, and then you put one minus cosine squared of phi, and you divide it by one minus cosine squared of phi. So then that's why you get the one. And in here, you basically take in the derivative of this guy at zero. Okay, so then you get that. Okay, any case, you compute what this is and what you get is exactly, and then put this as an exercise. Um, you get exactly this. Okay, and so if you look, if you look here, you get exactly this. So this bit here, so if you replace alpha by alpha plus theta, you have the same result. So this bit here is basically becoming uh, equal to that guy. And this guy here is basically converging to that guy. Because the same result here is now applicable when you replace P by Q and alpha 
also by alpha plus theta whenever because it didn't depend. And so this bit is converging to that, to, to, sorry, this guy is doing, converging to that, and this guy is converging to that when x is converging to one. Well, it's not exactly this because you have this factor one minus x squared, but since the, there is a quotient here, you can factor this extra factor out. And in any case, so this easy implies that the limit when x goes to one, well, let me just then write what it is, that f1 alpha p, interpret as the limit. Let me put it like this. Uh, this is q. At x equals one equals the right hand side. Okay, and so this finishes step one, because then I can take in from one on both sides and I get this inequality. Okay, so step two. So now we're gonna show this is true, and this is more complicated. Um, and then I'm gonna show this for, um, one less or equal than p, less or equal than two, less or equal than q, less than infinity. But we can assume that p is not one, so let's do that. We're gonna show first in that case, which is easier, okay? That is the two is between p and q. And then you can think, well, it could also be the case that q is on the right of q. And then it could also be the case that two is on the left of p. But these cases are dual to each other. Okay, so I only need to show one of them, which would be the other step, step three. Okay. Okay. So the claim now, so we just computed those limits here for this and this limit. And the claim is that actually this thing, this limit is actually a lower bound for this whole thing. And, um, and for the other guy with the Q is actually a upper bound. And so we will be able to actually deduce that if you don't put X equals one, just put any X, then this is actually lesser. Uh, sorry, this is actually greater or equal than this point wise. Okay. And, and for every, um, for every alpha and uh, for every x. And so for you can deduce greater equal than zero. So let me write what the claim is. And then if I apply, so the claim is twofold, this one and this guy. Okay, so if I apply this for alpha replaced by alpha plus theta, and so if we divide this by that, we conclude that this, in, this thing is greater or equal than this side. Okay, uh, just by dividing these two terms. Um, and how do I show this? Well, it's actually just, you can show it just by one simple thing. Um, um, okay, so I'm gonna prove the easiest case. Um, I'm gonna prove what? When I'm gonna prove, I'm gonna prove, let me put some numbers here, A and B. I will prove A and you can read uh, 
And this is what? This is proposition. I put the name here. Well, in any case, you can read Weisler's paper. I thought I'd put this. Um, Okay, this is proposition eight. In any case, let me prove. I just put prove A first. Okay. How can you show that? Um, um, Let's see. Um, okay, so what is one minus x squared divided by x alpha p squared? So we're going to make use of this change of variables again, just like we did to compute this limit here. Now we do know that this is r minus 2 cosine squared of b divided by sine squared of phi. And so we can write what that is exactly. And this will be a half one minus sine two phi cosine theta p over two plus a half one plus sine two phi cosine theta p over two, everything to two over p. Um, Oh, this was one over p, this was not two over p, sorry. Because we're just taking p root here. But this was two over p. Oh, no, this was two over p, so. My bad. In any case, we have this. Let me just move this slightly to the left. And then minus cosine squared of phi divided by, well, sine squared of phi. Okay, so now we're going to make the following change of variables, another change of variables. And then we made that so that um, square root of one plus or minus sine of two phi cosine theta is equal to one plus or minus s divided by one plus s squared. So the idea here is the following. So I'm going to rewrite this in another way by this. Okay, so you define s by this equation and just figure out what s is in the end. And S is exactly that. Okay. So, but but why I want to write this thing in this shape? Because I want to use real hyperconvertivity. I want to put this thing inside here. Okay. And then I will have something with the plus because you can already see that there is a P over two, P over two here, two over P. So I want to use real hyperconvertivity here, uh, but I have to put in a correct shape because uh, um, there is a, I want to use for P, I don't want to use for P over two as the exponent. So I want to put this in the correct way. So there is this root here that I have to write as something. And this is the something I have to write it. Okay. So then one minus X squared divided by F X alpha P squared is um, what? So let me, just completely right what it is. 
and a half, and then one minus s to the power p, one plus s to the power p, uh, two over p minus cosine squared of phi divided by sine squared of phi. Okay. Because, well, this is, was the root, it was the root, so I replaced by this one minus one plus, and there was an extra, this guy which came out, and it, came, it comes out like that. Okay, then I can say that this is greater or equal using hyperconjunctivity from, um, from LP to L2. So there is a multiplication by square root of um, P minus one divided by two minus one. Okay, so which is one. So I just multiply here. So this is real hyperconjunctivity, And then what I get is one half, one minus square root of P minus one S is squared plus one half, one plus square root of P minus one S is squared to the power, just that. But if you open this up, you can open this as squared, right? What, what it is, is exactly one plus P minus one S is squared, and then minus cosine squared phi. And this whole thing divided by sine squared of phi. And the question is, is this greater or equal than one plus P minus two cosine squared of phi, of alpha, sorry of alpha. Oh, this was alpha. This was theta. Uh, wait. There's something. Um, where the alpha went? Well, the alpha is only on the S. Okay, this is still theta. Yes, the alpha is only on yes. Okay, alpha. So that's the question. If if this thing, well, that's what we wanted to prove. That was a claim. Okay. So what I did is, is rewrote, you know, apply hyperconjunct real hyperconjunctivity, got something, and then you want to verify if this is true. Okay. And if you do the Q case, which is analogous, um, I think you will get exactly the opposite inequality because you can use hyperconjunctivity going to give you the opposite uh, inequality. Okay. Um, because we assume, so recall, we're assuming here that P is less than two and Q is greater than two. So when P is less than two, I can use hyperconjunctivity from LP to L2 and it will give the inequality in this direction. When Q is bigger than two, then I use real hyperconjunctivity and it would give me the inequality in the opposite direction. Okay. In any case, um, I will leave you to feel the details for, for, this, for this thing. So read, reading exercise. But you can basically figure out what it is. You just do the exactly same proof, but just when you apply hyperconductivity, and you, it will go in the opposite direction. Okay, so the question is that. Uh, and now this is equivalent to what? This is equivalent if you multiply everything out. This is equivalent to ask. So this is just multiplication in rearranging terms. Uh, no, no, right. Uh, 
and then they substitute back s by what it is and i this is equivalent to this question okay so what i do is is this greater or equal than that okay so what you do is just multiply both sides by this sine squared move cosine squared on the other side so you can already see there is a nice constellation because you have sine squared of phi plus cosine squared of phi this adds to one whatever and then you replace by what s it is and then you rearrange terms and that's what you get okay um, so recall that p is less or equal than two here okay so this is now equivalent to um so we can cancel these ones and uh on both sides uh you can divide by p over two and then this will be equivalent to this statement so basically you cancel here and you cancel here multiply both sides by two and then uh multiply both sides by two but oh, yes p is less than two so when you cancel this guy so this is negative by the way so when you cancel the, the inequality uh, uh, flips flips its side so that's what you want to show and then so you just open so you just isolate square and then what you have is that is this um and then you check that is true okay so just isolate so you isolate this term you square both sides cancel whatever you have to cancel and then you deduce any inequality that's obviously true okay and then okay so this shows this shows the first case. And the second case, as I said, B is exactly, is exactly, um, as I mentioned, you just you do the same thing, but hyperconductivity will give you the opposite direction and then you have it. Okay, so that was step two. Let me go to step three. We're almost there. So step three, we have to show this it will be what still we want to prove that's greater or equal but now for two less or equal than p less we don't need to if one is two um less than infinity if one is two is in the other case so we, we can assume that p is bigger than two and q is greater than three because we want to avoid the case where these numbers are bigger between two and three. And this is the only one I have to show because the other ones, when two is above three, Q, this Q is less or equal than two, is will be the dual of this case, which we don't need to show. Okay. So the first thing is, uh, is we can assume, right in green, we can assume that so we take in an infimal let me go back i want to show three and show that this so already showed this okay and we already showed this in particular case when p when choose between p and q and then i want to show this for the case where p with two is less or equal than p and q greater or equal than p but also greater than three. Um, and then we have to show this. Okay. So we'll take an infimum here. Okay. So now the claim is that um, um, I, this infimum here is the same 
if I impose some extra conditions on alpha. Okay. Let me maybe copy here. Right here, claim. The infimum of zero less or equal than alpha less or equal than pi over two minus theta and an infimum of the same thing. Okay, so why? Well, first of all, if you remember, this function only depends on cosine of alpha. And so if I change alpha by minus alpha, then nothing changes. So I can definitely assume that alpha is less so equal um, than, uh, uh, that's less so equal than um, between zero and pi, say. Uh, so what I want to say, yes, between zero and pi. But then you also, well, since it depends on cosine, it depends on cosine squared or cosine alpha. Always. Cosine alpha is. Um, so cosine alpha plus pi will be minus cosine alpha, but minus cosine alpha is on the other side. So it's also invariant by changing alpha to alpha plus pi. Okay, so, and it also is invariant by changing alpha to alpha to minus alpha. So I definitely can assume that this is true for these both conditions. But then you realize something. You realize that you can also assume that, um, you can also assume this further constraint because you can assume that cosine squared of alpha plus theta is greater or equal than cosine squared of alpha. It's just, just by the shape of the functions, okay? And I will leave this as a reading exercise because we have so many things to do. Um, so this is proposition six. So reading exercise, okay? But it's not so hard to believe that we can assume such a thing. Okay, so now we only have this condition. And now the, the second claim is the following. Is that um, fx alpha q squared and fx alpha plus theta q squared uh, is greater or equal than this. This is C, C and D is that Fx alpha Q is squared divided by Fx alpha p squared is greater or equal than and this is true when alpha is and this is actually true uh, for every guy but so now we only need to know this range which is included in this range in any case. Um, so suppose we know that. Suppose C and D are in fact true. Then you look at this quotient here. And what you can do is say, take this and multiply what we can do. Uh, Yes, so what you do is you, you take this 
Okay, and then you take this with alpha, replace it by alpha plus theta, which I can assume because I am assuming that this is true, then alpha plus theta is less than pi over two. And so I can apply the lemma. So if alpha plus theta is less or equal than pi over two, I can apply D with alpha replaced by alpha plus theta. Okay, so then if I multiply this guy with this guy with alpha replaced by alpha plus theta, then this guy cancels with that. And we just have X alpha Q squared and X alpha plus theta P, which is exactly this. But then you have this greater equal than that times this. But then if you replace alpha by alpha plus theta here, and then alpha plus theta here, now this bit cancels with that bit. And then what we get is just P over two, P minus two alpha plus theta divided by Q, which is exactly what we want to prove. Everything works correctly. So if I prove C and D, I, get, I have the result, okay? So I'm only going to show um, C. So this would be a reading exercise as well. They are similar, but it's not the same proof. And D is a bit more complicated actually. Um, um, I'm only gonna show C. Um, yes, okay, so let's go. So proof of C, how do we do that? Great. So you first of all, let's, let's make a change of variables. So what we'll call S equals cos alpha, and then we'll call K equals Q over two, Q minus two over two, and Z would be something greater or equal than zero. Okay. And then I will define this function here, which will be this guy here. One plus Z squared divided by one plus two K S squared minus two Z S divided by one plus two K S squared half. Well, maybe I should define this in the other line. Uh, K plus one plus, and then this thing is with the other sign. Okay, this is the function. And then what you realize, and this is a calculation you have to do, is that f of x, y, alpha, q is actually equal to x, 2k plus 2, g of z, s, k, where z here is, so let me make the change of variables here already y square root of one plus two k s squared. Mm. Yes. So, so what we did was to take the original equation of X, which um, with this, the Q and um, 
Um, yes. So let me do it then. Do you see that that's this is so what is what was this guy? This guy was uh, um, x. Let me write here. Let's go x squared y squared plus two x y cos alpha. This was q over two. Um, yes, and then this is x squared plus y squared two x y cos alpha q over two. So that was the function f x y alpha q. That was the function. Okay, no, no, just erase. So what we did is we isolated x to the power q, but then by the change of variables is 2k plus 2. Okay, so let me put 2k plus 2 there. And then the this became a 1 alpha over x squared, and this y over x, and this is y over x. This is 1 plus y over x squared. Great. And then what we did was, um, oh, this was S now. And this was S. And now what we do is what we, we, um, oh, of course, Q over two is K plus one. So this is K plus one. There was a two here that I forgot. And now uh, I divide and multiply by And then basically what you do is you just replace what y over x is, and then you get that formula, okay? So this is basically what we did. Um, right, so we have this. So this equals two. So the nice thing here is that I isolated x, so I can remove x from the equation here. So if that is, um, Um, what do I want? Yeah, so suppose that that it was to, um, oh, we did that with P, but I'm doing here with Q, uh, just bear with me for the moment. Um, so if that is true, if and only if, say Y equals F of X alpha Q, but this is if and only if, if, and who is y? Well, y is by this thing is zx divided by something. So xz equals one plus two ks squared times f of x alpha q. And, and again, it is, easy to show by the same reason that G, uh, that F was, had positive derivative. You can show that G has the, also positive derivative. Then if we let, G of S K B such that uh, G of S K S K B equal to two X minus two to the K minus two, then um, um, 
z has to be that, then x g s k has to be square root plus one plus k s squared. Um, f of x alpha q. And what is this? This is exactly square root of one plus q minus two cosine of square root of alpha. Okay. Okay. So we have this by this, this change of variables. And what, what, it, what I'm doing here, well, I want to show C. So what I want to do, I want to take this term, multiply by that guy, and take square root. So I want to know what that guy is. And um, note that there is a Q here. So this inequality here is equivalent to the statement that when I put root here, put root there, eliminate these squares, and then multiply that both sides. So it's equivalent to the statement that f x alpha q times square root of one plus q minus two cosine alpha squared is increasing in alpha because uh, decreasing, sorry. Decrease. Yeah, so I want to show, so let me write that here. So C is equivalent to square root of one plus Q minus two cosine square root of alpha, F of X alpha Q decreasing in alpha. If that is true, then this is greater than it evaluated at alpha plus theta, okay? And I'm assuming that theta is positive here, which we can always assume um, because theta is, is the argument of Ho. And since we can change Ho by its complex uh, conjugate, so changing theta by minus theta, can always assume that theta is positive. Um, so that's what we're assuming here. Um, and then, so this, Inequality is equivalent to the statement that a certain function is decreasing. Okay, so that's what we want to show. And well, differentiating this in alpha and say that the derivative is a less than zero uh, is the same as showing that um, since x is fixed here, I want to differentiate this in alpha and show that this is something. That is, this, uh, this function decreases with alpha, but if alpha decreases, S increases. So I have to show that is positive. Okay. And then it comes the fact, but. Since g s of g um, yes, but since so okay, both are positive, of course. Um, you have g s of g. Oh, sorry, this is not one of the three. Just z is positive. Um, Yes, so if I differentiate this in S, what I get is Z dSG plus SG equals zero, because we know that this thing is zero and X is fixed, this thing is true and X is fixed. So I differentiate in S when Z is replaced by G and then we get this equation. And since this thing is positive, then this is equivalent of showing that the derivative of S is negative, okay? So to show the derivative of little g is positive in S, it's the same as showing that the derivative in S and capital G is less than zero. Okay, so we are almost there. 
Um, so how can I show this? And then you have to compute the derivative in S and it's a mess, of course. However, we can do it. And I would just write the simplified version here for you. This is V is another variable that I would write in a moment. Where V is Z divided by so the question is is this negative okay in any case you do the computation you see what it is and it is that okay and then we are almost there and so the question is one plus v squared minus two s v um, k times one plus two k s v is this um, greater or equal because there is a minus in the beginning here. So this has to be greater or equal than. And then, so this is kind of a true, it's kind of a trivial. If 2SV is greater or equal than one, then we're kind of done because this is negative. And um, this thing here is always positive because the variable s is always between zero and one, it's a cosine. So this thing here is always positive. So if this thing, is, so this left hand side is always positive. So if this is greater or equal than one, this is less or equal than zero. So this is trivial. If we have this, uh, we can assume it's greater than zero, by the way, then. Uh, we want to show that one plus v squared plus a minus two v s v one plus v squared minus plus two s v is greater or equal than one minus two k or two k s v two k s v yes divided by one plus two K S V one over Q. That's the question. And um, if K equals a half, for instance, then this is trivial because then it just can open everything because then this will be a square. You can open everything. And I recall that K, that K was, Q minus two over two. So Q is greater or equal than, than three. Uh, so, uh, so being equal to three will be the case of half. So that is trivial. And then if K is greater than a half, then I would leave as an exercise, check that uh, D, D, K, of this function here is less than zero. And so it decreases, so it's maxima is when k equals a half and k equals a half, this inequality is true. And so therefore the whole thing is true. And we have proven the hyperconjunctivity. So it was a long ride, it's a longer class. There's still some gaps you have to fill by reading the, the actual proof, but it's a very neat, but also technical kind of proof is one of these very complicated. You can see this as a very complicated calculus exercise, if you wish, 
But any case, this was a big result at the time. And, uh, and I hope you enjoyed and see you next time.